Hi everyone, I'm Courtney Lawn Heath. I'm a radiologist and nuclear medicine physician at UCSF. So we do a lot of radiopharmaceutical therapy, including PRRT at UCSF, and I'm very excited about what the future holds in this space. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. I have no disclosures. Now, first I wanna make sure that we're all kind of up to date on the current state of PRRT. Where are we now in clinical practice? Before then going on to discuss all the sort of exciting future developments that are happening. So just to bring us all up to speed, now we probably all know that well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor cells have a lot of these somatostatin receptors on their surface, right? And of course, we take advantage of this in first-line therapy for this disease using somatostatin analogs like octreotide. And these things like octreotide bind to the somatostatin receptor. This triggers a whole bunch of different events that sort of inhibit growth of the tumor cell. Uh, but one other thing that happens is that binding of this SSA to the receptor actually causes that cell to internalize the whole complex, to sort of eat the complex. And so that over time, you actually get this accumulation of SSA inside the tumor cell. Now that's something we can take advantage of with PRRT. I call it the Trojan horse strategy, where we use radioactive octreotide instead of plain octreotide which to the unsuspecting you know, tumor cell looks just like regular octreotide, so it binds to the receptor in the same way, and the unsuspecting cell internalizes it in the same way. The only difference being, of course, it's radioactive, right? And so as more and more build up inside the tumor cell, the damage being done in the tumor cell starts to build up, including free radicals, and it leads to DNA damage, and uh, hopefully eventually tumor cell death. Now the molecule that we use for PRRT currently, the actual molecule has a few different like puzzle pieces that compose it. And each of these pieces can be sort of swapped out and tweaked. And that's what we're gonna hear about for the future directions section. But as far as what we use now, the combination of puzzle pieces, we have a somatostatin analog, uh, and that's actually the part that's called Tate. We have DOTA, which is something called a chelator, uh, but the way I like to think of it is basically to me, this structure looks kind of like a bird's nest. And then the last puzzle piece is the egg inside the bird's nest, which is the little radioactive atom, in this case, lutetium-177. Now, this sort of assembly of puzzle pieces here, lutetium dotatate, is that compound that we currently use for PRRT most commonly. It was FDA approved in 2018. And it was largely on the basis of this landmark 2016 Netter 1 trial, which you may have heard about, which essentially pitted regular SSA against PRRT and found that PRRT patients overall had a 79% lower risk of disease progression or death compared to the regular SSA group. Also, PRRT improved several really important quality of life factors like physical functioning and the frequency of diarrhea. Well, so that study started in 2016, they updated it in 2018, but they've continued to follow the patients a number of years out. So actually last year, the final overall survival analysis came out and because this was a big important trial, everybody in the field was waiting really anxiously for that result. So I wanted to update you on it too. It showed that the median overall survival of the PRRT group was four years compared to three years for the control group. But when they ran a statistical analysis, they found out actually this difference didn't turn out to be statistically significant. Uh, but it does turn out there was a really big confounder that messed up the data a lot here. And that is that 36% of patients, over a third of patients in the control arm that weren't supposed to get PRRT actually did end up getting PRRT after all when they progressed, but they were still counted as being in the control group. So th this definitely you know, underestimated the efficacy of PRRT as a result. So that's a limitation. So for now, Lutetium Dotatate definitely remains the champion in the PRRT space, but there are some challengers and some stiff competition. And alpha PRRT is gonna be one of those, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But so now that we're on the same page kind of about PRRT currently, let's talk about a few ways that we can make it better. And perhaps the most obvious way is to take our, what we already have, our current PRRT agent, and just simply try to improve it in a couple of different ways. You know, we're starting to use PRRT in settings that we wouldn't have used it in before. So just expanding the use of it. 
For instance, surgically resectable disease. Now, it didn't used to be that you would say the words surgery and PRRT in the same breath, uh, but now it's actually starting to be used in the pre-surgical setting to potentially shrink tumors enough to turn them from unresectable to resectable. So people, patients who couldn't get surgery might be able to get surgery. It was 26% of the patients in this study that saw that happen, so it was the minority, but still worth a shot. PRT is also being looked at in higher grade disease. That landmark NETR1 trial limited patients to only a grade one or grade two net and a KI-67 of under 20%. But there are a couple of more recent studies that are actually including grade threes that are getting PRRT and also KI-67s up to 55%. So expanding uh, the usefulness potentially here. And lastly, the use is expanding outside of gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And frankly, starting to really get used in just about any disease, you name it. If it's avid, if it's hot on dotatate PET, uh, then it's potentially able to be treated with PRRT. And that includes this rare malignant paraganglioma disease where PRRT has been found to achieve disease control in about two thirds of patients. Uh, and in bronchial neuroendocrine, which is in the lungs, and that's uh, there's actually an open and ongoing multicenter clinical trial in that space right now. Now, another change we can make to our existing therapy is we can use something called dosimetry. If you haven't heard of this term, dosimetry, uh, you, this probably won't be the last you'll hear of it. I'm going to explain what it is in just a second, but just to kind of contextualize why I'm talking about it, let's just recall currently how PRRT works, right? How it's dosed. Currently, all patients get the same administered activity, no matter how much they weigh, how hot their disease is on dotatate PET, how fast they metabolize it, whether they have a lot of disease or a little disease, whether it looks like this or this or this or this. And unlike with chemo, PRRT, we can actually trace exactly, we don't have to just administer it and, and cross our fingers. We can trace exactly where and how much radiopharmaceutical went where in the body in each person, and we can measure the resulting radiation dose that was delivered to each tumor and to organs that are at risk, like maybe the kidneys. And this act of measuring radiation dose, that's what we call dosimetry. And it turns out that radiation dose that's delivered to tumors and to background organs like kidneys varies hugely from one patient to the next. And it's not actually something that's predictable by other factors. You can't just look at a person or look at their blood work or anything and, and, and determine ahead of time uh, what the dose is gonna be like. You need imaging uh, to, to do this dosimetry. And so anyway, this indicated to us, there's probably room for greater personalization than just sort of this one size fits all, same dose for everyone kind of approach. So here's an example of a study called personalized PRRT or PPRRT, where 36 patients got personalized PRRT based on results of dosimetry. But they actually then did a simulation where they back calculated, well, what would the doses, the radiation doses to the tumors and stuff, how much radiation would they have gotten if we had just done this like one size fits all regular approach? And what they found was that patients' tumors using the personalized dosimetry approach received almost 1.5 times higher radiation doses compared to when personalized dosimetry was not used. So this shows we're probably actually currently underdosing a lot of patients. And who knows, we may even be overdosing some other patients because we're just not measuring it. So instead of that, in the future, we want to use post-treatment imaging to make sure that we're delivering the right amount of radiation to suit each different person's disease and each different person's unique kind of metabolism and everything. In other words, we actually image the PRRT that was given to a patient. You can actually image it after the fact and calculate how much dose went where in the body. And we would then use this information to determine either how much activity a patient should get next time or how many total cycles uh, you should do until they're optimally treated. And in fact, this was tried in Europe in a study of 200 patients who just, they just kept giving them fixed cycles of PRT over and over again with dosimetry though, so they knew when to stop, until they maxed out what, what they thought to be a safe radiation dose to their kidneys. It turns out some patients actually could only safely receive three cycles of PRT, but some patients were able to safely get as many as nine cycles of PRRT, which of course is way beyond the four that we typically allow. And again, there was no other way that this was predictable based on anything else other than just using dosimetry. Ultimately though, 
We need randomized trials in order to confirm this and to determine whether this has any actual impact on uh, important things like survival. Now, the next thing we can do with, again, our existing PRRT molecule is we can try to improve kind of where it goes and how long it kind of sticks around in the body. So one way is called intra-arterial PRRT. And so in some context here is that so for patients like this patient has a bunch of tumors in the liver. For patients like this where it's mostly in the liver and no, nowhere else, it seems almost like overkill, frankly, to give PRRT, right? Because that, that exposes the whole body to radiation when really almost all the disease is just in one organ, right? So if we were able to just give PRRT to the liver instead of the whole body, you know, would it treat those liver tumors better and would there be less uh, toxicity to the rest of the body? So we tried this at UCSF actually with 10 people, a pilot study. We told our interventional radiology colleagues, hey, stop doing embolizations for just a second. And can you instead try giving PRRT into that main blood vessel that directly feeds the liver? In other words, intra-arterial and in patients with a lot of liver disease compared to IV, which is where we give it to the whole body, the intraarterial administration resulted in a lot more uptake in the tumors, as you can see from on the right, the sort of darker appearance of those tumors. Um, but strangely, this didn't actually hold up in every single patient, especially patients with less disease in the liver. In fact, this patient, we actually saw the opposite. The tumors didn't light up as much. Now we have some possible sort of explanations maybe as to why this happened, and we have some ideas for maybe a way to regroup and, and try again going forward, but for now uh, we're sticking with the IV whole body route uh, for that reason. Now another thing people have tried to do is to take that PRRT dotatate molecule and modify it so it doesn't get flushed out of the body so fast. You know, the kidneys flush out any of that radiation that doesn't go to the tumors uh, into the urine. It makes really expensive urine. And the rationale here of making it stick around longer in the bloodstream is, well, hey, if it's sticking around longer, maybe there's more around that will go to the tumors instead of just going out into making that expensive urine. So to do this, they took the regular dotatate molecule. This is that same kind of puzzle piece molecule that I showed you before, and they literally just stuck another big old puzzle piece on it called Evans Blue, which just happens to bind to a substance in the bloodstream called albumin. The specific details don't matter, but the bottom line is that this modification made it so that it didn't get taken out of the bloodstream by the kidneys so fast. It stuck around a lot longer than regular PRRT. So these are images of someone who got regular PRRT. So like I said, we can image this, right? So this is an image of the PRRT itself in the patient after they got it. The left image is three hours after getting PRRT and the right image is uh, three days after getting PRRT. And you can see how much fainter the uptake looks on day three, right? And that's because regular PRRT, the kidneys are flushing it out full time. And so it's, it's leaving the bloodstream quickly. In contrast, using this modified molecule, this patient on the right there, they didn't wait three days, they waited seven days before re-imaging, and you can see the tumors look just as bright as they did on day one. And so this confirmed the idea that, hey, if PRRT sticks around longer in the bloodstream, more of it will go to the tumors and maybe treat them for longer. But, and there's always a but, isn't there, with these? Yeah, <laughs> the radiation dose to the kidneys because of this was over three times higher unfortunately, than with regular PRRT. And most importantly, the dose to the bone marrow, which is what makes all your blood cells and is really important, was over 18 times higher. So this was a sort of a deal breaker for this, or at least a big challenge to the further use of this otherwise really promising tweak to PRRT. But suffice it to say, people are thinking about these things and their thorny problems, uh, but trying to find creative ways to optimize these therapies. Uh, but now let's move on to talk about some actual new varieties of PRRT and the ways that those new varieties kind of change the, the paradigm a little bit. And the first one is changing how uh, these agents interact with the somatostatin receptor. They still bind that same receptor, but they interact in a different way. We saw earlier how regular PRRT, there's that Trojan horse analogy where we sort of trick the tumor cell into taking up this radioactive SSA. Turns out about 75% of those molecules get internalized into the cell and about 25% just sort of stay stuck on the outside membrane of the tumor cell. So that's regular PRRT. There's a new type of PRRT that uses somatostatin receptor antagonists, which just 
interacts with the receptors in a different way. And one of the sort of incidental effects of that is actually most of that antagonist PRRT doesn't go into the cell. It stays stuck out on the cell membrane. And it, that's weird, actually, because we always initially thought that the radiation had to get inside the tumor cell to really have its maximum effect. But some early clinical trial data is showing hmm, maybe that's not needed. So here's one of these uh, studies that made us think that. And again, this is using the antagonist PRRT instead of agonist, which is the regular PRRT. They gave this new antagonist PRRT to 51 patients, most of whom had actually already been through regular PRRT before. And the response rate was about a third of patients, which if you'll recall is higher than for regular PRRT, which is under 20%. And there were no severe toxicities of any kind. And another thing I think is kind of crazy about this particular study is that 72% of the patients in this study had such low uptake on their like pre-treatment dotatate PET scans, their uptake on the, in their tumors was so low, they wouldn't have actually even qualified for regular PRRT based on that imaging. So this kind of opens up, in addition to being a new kind of compound, opens up kind of a new range of net patients who might be able to benefit from PRRT, which is kind of cool. Now the next difference that some new PRRT agents have is a different type of radiation. And so with this puzzle piece analogy here, we're talking about that little radioactive egg in the nest. You can just swap out that egg. So lutetium is the one that we commonly use and that emits what's called a beta particle. Some new agents are swapping out that lutetium for an atom that emits alpha particles. So beta particles are small and fast and they travel kind of far, but they can only do a little bit of damage. Alpha particles are big and slow, and that means they can actually do kind of a lot of damage at their target, but also that they don't travel very far in the body. And the fact that they don't travel very far in the body actually might be good because it might mean that they don't affect the normal nearby tissues as much. They may cause less collateral damage. And this has been really promising in clinical trials. So here's 32 patients. All of them had already had regular beta PRRT, and over half had actually progressed while they were on PRRT. So they were basically resistant to regular PRRT. They got alpha PRRT with actinium, and well over half of them actually had a response. And again, that's compared to under 20% of patients uh, who get beta PRRT. And importantly, there were no severe toxicities, even with this increase in efficacy, which is exciting. So that's why there's kind of a lot of buzz right now about alpha PRRT, maybe maybe threatening the crown of regular or beta PRRT. And last, I want to explore some new treatment combinations with PRRT that are being looked at with the rationale that, hey, if two different treatments are effective individually, why can't you combine them together to see if they have an even bigger effect, right? If PRRT works well, and we know something like, let's say, Everolimus works well, hey, can we put them together? Maybe it'll be, maybe they'll be even better together. So PRT has been combined with Everolimus, for example. Um, and a trial that looked at this found, as you might expect, a higher response rate with the combination than with either one alone. But unfortunately, there was also a lot more toxicity than with either one alone. In other words, a lot more kind of bad side effects than either one alone. In fact, all patients required that Everolimus be stopped or dose reduced because of the significant toxicity. So that seems to be there seems to be a trade-off here by, you know, you go up on the, on the efficacy, you may also go up on toxicity with these combination therapies. PRT has also been combined with chemo. So this control nets trial is doing this and their initial results are better response, but more side effects than either treatment alone. So are you sensing the theme here? This is kind of a common theme with these combination treatments. The next interesting combination, this one is a, is a pretty new one. It's PRRT with what's called a PARP inhibitor. Now, what the heck is a PARP inhibitor? Well, that is a drug that prevents a type of DNA repair. And why is that interesting? Well, remember the strategy here with PRRT, right, is you, is you give it, it's radioactive, and it works by damaging tumor cell DNA with the radioactivity. If you also use a PARP inhibitor, then you're going to prevent that you've just damaged the, two, the DNA with radioactivity and now you're giving a drug that's going to prevent that damage from being repaired, right? And so hopefully the tumor cell will die as a result of being unable to repair the damage that the PRRT has done. 
And this has been super promising in preclinical studies. And there's actually a clinical trial in humans going on right now at the National Cancer Institute, and I imagine some other locations as well. So we'll see if that bears fruit in reality. So a few takeaway points here. Uh, PRT use is expanding and improving. And personalized dosimetry may allow for treatment optimization. Somatostatin receptor antagonists are promising, although some may have more toxicity than agonists. And alpha emitters can potentially overcome beta resistance. And lastly, the combination therapies may increase the effectiveness of PRRT, although we have to be careful that it doesn't also increase the toxicity. All in all, though, the future is really bright. I hope that this gives you some sense of that. There are a lot of people thinking about this, playing around with this, and, and I think that uh, we have a lot to look forward to in this space. So I would like to thank very much the, my incredible mentors, Tom Hope, Emily Bergsland, and the amazing UCSF PRRT team that's headed up by Sheila Lindsay and Rebecca Miro. Also, a special thank you to patients who enroll in clinical trials. Honestly, cancer will not be cured without patients who enroll in clinical trials. So thank you. And thank you so much to the organizers to, for having me and to everybody for your attention. And I hope you have a great rest of the evening. Mm.